Institute of International Affairs. And uh, first of all, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are joining us here in person as well as those who are joining us online via various uh, social media platforms. Um, the topic of today's discussion is understanding the Germany, one year after Zeitenwende. Last week we were reflecting and remembering uh, the, well, first of all, those who were suffered and uh, those who also were killed during the brutal aggression uh, of, of Russia in Ukraine. But today is another anniversary. Today is uh, one year, exactly one year ago, uh, on the 27th of uh, February, um, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz gave his famous speech, Zeitenwende. Well, from some of the academics, experts, analytics, uh, this was a transforming or turning point uh, when it comes to the German foreign and security policy. And I would, I would agree with that. Uh, uh, I would support or subscribe to this um, uh, analysis. But on the other hand, what we witnessed during the, the, the last 12 months is that there are still discrepancies or there are still differences on how we here in the Baltic states and Germany perceives uh, when it comes to the uh, strategy, uh, how to deal with the Russia's aggression in Ukraine, uh, when it comes to the particular um, deterrence and defense posture here in the Baltic states and in the eastern flank of the NATO, um, there are also questions whether Germany itself is homogeneous, <laughs> right? Uh, whether there are uh, still uh, dynamics, internal discussions, uh, and uh, um, Germany is, sti is still developing, is still transforming. That was as a starting point, and still Germany is, is uh, transforming. That will have a long-lasting consequences, not only how Germany perceives itself uh, in Europe, in Euro-Atlantic community, but also it will definitely affect also the security of uh, Baltic states. And um, I would argue that uh, recently, in the couple uh, uh, months, uh, Germany has been, if I may, hot potato, right? Or hot discussion in, in, in Latvian public media. Uh, we have been giving a lot of interviews. Most of the experts here sitting in, in this room have been trying to understand the Germany, trying to rationalize the, <laughs> the position or the stance of the Germany. And uh, having um, a close cooperation with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, internal brainstorm, we came up with an idea, let's do it. Let's have a frank discussion. Let's have an open discussion on uh, understanding the Germany, uh, what it takes to deal with the Germany. What is the Germany, <laughs> after all? And therefore, <coughs> sorry, and therefore, uh, I'm delighted to also welcome uh, Oliver Morinsky, who is head of uh, Konrad Stiftung in the Baltic States for your introductory remarks. And thank you for cooperating and supporting this discussion. Please, Oliver. Yeah, thanks, Martin, and uh, welcome, um, everyone. Uh, very uh, thankful and happy to see you, you all here in uh, presence and also all the uh, people who are joining in and tuning in virtually. Uh, indeed, I'm very thankful also that uh, I'm today not the only uh, German who has to describe <laughs> and explain <laughs> uh, Germany, that we have uh, some guests who can, dis, uh, can do this much better, especially on this topic. Uh, but indeed, um, Martin, as you said, uh, for Germany this day is quite an, let's say, half historic day. Uh, 27th of February, speech of Olaf Scholz in the German Bundestag about uh, Zeitenwende. Uh, and when we look on the speech, I would say it, it's a very good speech. He said everything inside what it needs to be. Uh, it's uh, good pointed and it's uh, timely, uh, very good, uh, let's say, positioned. He's speaking about uh, experiencing a Zeitenwende. He's promising that we, Germany, will invest more in uh, defense and in security, and also that Germany will take over more responsibility when it comes to the new challenges of Germany and also of Europe. The, but the question is, uh, what is delivered and what is executed? Uh, where are we after one year of Zeitenwende? Uh, without a doubt, Germany is in a big political 
uh, change. And we see this in different uh, topics when it comes to energy, for example, the decoupling from Russian gas is for a big industrial nation like Germany a big thing. Also that uh, Germany is sending weapons into war regions, a big thing for the Green Party, for example. That Germany is investing in defense, uh, it's a big thing for the Social Democratic Party. So there are changes ongoing, but the question is, is it sufficient enough to be a Zeitenwender, what is, uh, the Chancellor was saying before. Um, and this is why, why we are here, and as you said, Martins, we're trying to understand it a bit better, uh, and also to, to discuss what is the political, let's say, uh, view back, what happened in the last year, uh, and what has to be done, and also from the practical point of view, what is uh, the German army, um, the Bundeswehr, uh, really capable of? Um, are there also over expectations maybe or, mm -hmm. or not uh, that's what we will see so uh, yeah we're, we're very happy that uh, we are here today also to speak about the possible leadership role of Germany which is uh, often uh, discussed and um, let's say mm, uh, demanded um, and in foreign policy it's a big a new thing for Germany Germany took leadership role for example when we look on the corona crisis on also when we look back in the economic and financial crisis Germany was a, a leading leading nation mm -hmm. in Europe, but in foreign policy, Germany is a bit reluctant. But uh, why is it, uh, why is it not? That's why we are here for. So thank you very much, you in person, and also Leah for the cooperation for this event, and thanks for uh, the experts, uh, Mr. Hart from the Bundestag and Benedikt Men for uh, coming here directly. And uh, without further ado, Martins, please uh, enlighten us and uh, let the guests enlighten us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oliver. I think if we can really yeah. move here. So uh, we will discuss, uh, we will kick off the discussion and I will introduce my, uh, or our <laughs> panelists today. First of all, joining us online, uh, Jürgen Hart, a German politician of the Christian Democrat Union who has served as a member of the Bundestag. Mr. Hart, uh, hopefully you, was, uh, you, you hear us loud and clear. Oh, we don't you. I have to unmute. Sorry. Now you can uh, hear me, I think. Um, perfect. I, uh, I have a perfect picture of the conference and therefore all is fine. Thank you. Thank you a lot for joining us online. And uh, in person, Benedict Mann, who is advisor for security and defense policy, member of the Young Foreign Policy Experts at Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Thank you. <laughs> um, if I may, uh, Mr. Hart, I would, I would like to start with you. Um, and first of all, with with introductory remarks for both of you, five to seven minutes, if I may. Um, do you mm. perceive Zeitenwende speech as really a historic turning point? Or as some of the scholars arguing that we are experiencing continuation of the German policy for the last decades? What is your reading? What is your perception of the Zeitenwende? Mm. First I, first, I would like to mention, uh, as foreign affairs spokesperson of the CDUCs, who I'm uh, closely um, uh, uh, looking on that, what the government is doing, but I'm in the opposite. The CDUCs in Germany is, uh, for a short period of time, I would like to say, in the role of um, leading the opposite. Um, when uh, the Bundestag was asked to go uh, um, for a special meeting on Sunday, the 27th of, of February last year, uh, we all expected uh, uh, an interesting speech of the Chancellor. And uh, as we have learned, um, he didn't communicate uh, significant parts of his speech uh, from the social democratic point of view, most critical points uh, to um, its own group in the Deutsche Bundestag. And therefore he gave that speech with uh, 100 billion extra for defense, uh, 100 billion euros extra for defense with 2% uh, from now on. Um, in all the messages we as CDUC is who applaud very lot for because we fought for more money for the Bundeswehr and we fought for reaching the 2% even in the coalition with the Social Democrats from 2018 on. Um, but uh, the reaction in his own camp, especially in the Social Democratic camp was very weak. The applause for that speech of the Chancellor was much bigger in CDUC is who um, uh, and uh, to be frank, also with the Liberals, as it was with the Greens and the Social Democrats. And um, we, uh, we gave an answer that we would like to support this way in its fundamental um, uh, pillars, which is 100 billion extra for Bundeswehr, 
and two uh, percent uh, um, um, to to uh, and uh, uh, weapons for Ukraine. These are, so to say, the three main points. But over the months, we saw that government is not executing mm. as expected. Um, I start with the two percent. He announced two percent up so far from now on. Uh, I fear that looking back to the figures of 22, um, I have not yet the final figures of the uh, of the um, uh, expenditures of the state for 22. The so to say the abrechnung, the final final sum of of uh, the the budget 22. But I fear that in 22 Germany is concerning uh, GDP share for defense lower than we were 2021 when we reached close to 1.5 percent and also in 2020 which was uh, responsibility of uh, Ursula von der Leyen and then uh, Annegret kamp karrenbauer um, uh, the second is that we uh, decided to change the constitution to make it possible to have this 100 billion um, uh, Sondervermögen extra budget for, for, for defense expenditures but we didn't see any order out of that 100 billion budget. We now have uh, learned that uh, the plan to buy the F-35 um, aircraft instead, uh, to replace the Tornado from that money, but uh, there is not yet uh, a, a treaty or a, a, a decision of the, def uh, of the uh, budget committee of the Bundestag to spend some of that money. And looking to that, what is urgent in Germany, ammunition, not only for delivering to Ukraine, but also for um, um, strengthening the Bundeswehr, a replacement of those 14 Panzerhubitze um, uh, 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 2000 that we gave to Ukraine. Uh, we normally would expect that uh, German Bundeswehr, German Bundeswehr should be replaced, uh, those six, uh, six, those 14 um, 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 cannons uh, by buying new. Uh, there is no decision on that. And um, uh, the third is that even with the question of delivery of weapons, it took a long time to decide on heavy weapons. The Bundestag agreed on a, a resolution end of April last year that we will send heavy weapons. That means also infantry tanks and, uh, and, and heavy tanks. Um, the, the government didn't decide that. Uh, the decision came three weeks ago, and um, as you know, it will take a long time to uh, train Ukrainian soldiers and to um, yeah to fit fit up the the existing um, used tanks in the German Rüstungsindustrie in the industry armament industry. They have uh, some old material on the stack the stock that can be modernized, but this needs. Um, uh, 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 several weeks, if not months, to do that. Um, so, several things that uh, Chancellor um, um, Scholz um, proposed to do are not fulfilled. And my 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 huge concern is that uh, um, this uh, is something that weakens the German uh, standing in the NATO and European Union community. And uh, uh, to give the Fourth and last um, um, ex uh, example for that, um, German government announced to send uh, 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 um, uh, a, a additional soldiers to uh, Rukla, to, to, to Lithonia, um, 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 up to going up from the battalion up to a, um, a brigade, and looking to the real um, capabilities of the Bundeswehr at the moment. Uh, we see weaknesses, and I fear that uh, this um, proposal of the German government towards people in the Baltic states and towards the people and the government in Lithuania cannot be fulfilled as soon as expected. And uh, um, therefore, um, I think we have a huge damage of trust in Germany due to those four um, uh, significant um, uh, points. Um, but to be frank, I think the Chancellor is judging on the mind and mood of its voters in Germany and looking to them. Uh, I think he is not um, he is not unpopular with doing such a um, uh, the way on, on the break. He is um, the people. Some of people like like. Christian Democrats, we in the Parliament, and also a lot of our voters and, and people in my constituency talking to me, 
uh, they are, um, uh, don't, will not accept this uh, way of, of the chancellor, but there's a minimum 50% in Germany of with a population that um, agrees on doing uh, slower than uh, announced and doing slower than um, maybe expected from, from NATO or, or other um, uh, partners. And this is where we, we uh, sit in between. And uh, the reason for the German reluctance to deliver weapons to Ukraine, to invest more in Bundeswehr and, and, and is also coming out of the situation that people are not able to judge really on what is right and what is wrong. They potentially need uh, leadership in that question. And normally the leadership uh, has to come from the chancellor uh, in such a difficult situation we are now and uh, we miss that leadership and therefore also the mind and mood in the German public is um, um, uh, uh, such ambivalent as I explained. Um, we ha work hard to come um, uh, to overcome that situation. Hopefully we are not too late with uh, more weapons for Ukraine um, because I think Russia used the last three months, four months better than uh, so to say the Western uh, world and Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine uh, cannot do it by itself. They need weapons and ammunition from us. Um, and I, I, I hope that we are not too late uh, because we cannot, um, uh, we will not uh, see, uh, will not have have to see a, a, a game change in uh, in Ukraine with success of Russia, which um, would be a huge risk for us all, and uh, brings us closer to a direct confrontation with Russia. Russia than it is now where Ukraine is doing a hard and good job for us all in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Hart, uh, for your introductory remarks. If I may follow up immediately, um, just briefly, I know this is uh, not an easy question or not a briefly answered question, but from your perspective, what I'm hearing and uh, understanding your point, that is the change of the policy, but not the change of the mindset. Am I right? <laughs> Still, the we are missing the change of the mindset that was uh, uh, well uh, perceived here in the Baltic states, hearing the Olaf Scholz. Uh, we are still seeing that the mindset is still, the change of the mind, the transformation is still in the process. Am I right? I have no other expl explanation for the reason that German government is not using the 100 billion euros for equipping Bundeswehr not increasing defense budget up to 2%, not delivering more heavy weapons to Ukraine. Uh, instead of that, the German government is not, or the chancellor is not willing to do that because he is, uh, um, he is uh, afraid of um, losing uh, support in the German public, uh, afraid of having a closer uh, or more direct confrontation with Russia, I don't know. He is uh, a book with seven seals. Um, he is not a good communicator. Um, even his party colleagues and, and supporters uh, uh, see him weak on the field of communication. And therefore, we can only um, a miracle around, uh, 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 wonder around what, 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 what the reasons might be. But looking to the concrete politics, um, I have to state, and this is um, difficult for me because I don't want to blame Germany, but um, um, I have to state that uh, the Zeit when the speech was a good speech, but the execution was very weak. And uh, as I explained in those three main fields, and also looking to the set what government said towards uh, Lithuania, um, Lithuania, um, 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 I think uh, there's a the big gap between uh, uh, lip service and concrete action. And this is a problem for Germany and a problem for Ukraine and us all. Thank you. We'll touch upon uh, definitely uh, to some of the issues that you pointed out. Uh, Benedict, uh, I read an article uh, soon after the Titan Vendor on The Garden saying that this is 180 degree uh, change of the course for the Germany. Uh, I think that the Patrick Winter uh, was, was the author of this uh, article naming that, well, that will definitely change the European security in mid and long term perspective. What's your reading on, on, on year after the entitlement, uh, where we are, what is the Germany? Oh, um, yeah, first of all, Martins and, and Oliver, thank you for, for having me here back in, back in Riga. Um, it's always great to be here. It's always great to be in the Baltic states when talking about security and defense policy because um, I feel very much understood in, in, in many ways. Um, but Seitenwende, yeah, um, 
is it a 180 degree turn? I don't know, but I think in Germany you can look at it this way. But before getting into all the negative aspects mm. about uh, Zeit yes. and <laughs> I I'd like to always acknowledge from an internal perspective within like the, the, the German security um, bubble, um, I have to acknowledge what a tremendous change it is. So when I think back one year, um, the discussions we were having before uh, February 24th and the discussions we're having now, I think um, this might not be enough. And I know from the outside this, uh, this looks uh, as is uh, that it is not enough. But uh, I can tell you from the inside, looking at it with a German uh, lens, it is tremendous what we're discussing. So um, that also is connected to, you mentioned the mindset. Um, I think uh, not all um, areas of society, but especially in civil society where the government is under delivering, I see in, in some so parts of the society a tremendous change. Mm -hmm. Is it enough? Perhaps not. But uh, at least uh, relatively we see, uh, we see good progress. Absolute is not enough. Um, when I, I also like to, to keep uh, in mind that Zeitenwende was imposed on Germany. It was not a choice. So when you think, when you analyze German policy, you always have to, to think that the, the government moves, um, they are reactive. Mm. And we're running behind in, in, in many ways because it was not a choice. It was imposed on the, on the German government. But when I think about Zeitman, of course, because I come from the security and defense field, I'd like to, to, to focus on that area. And uh, when doing so in the analysis, I, I, I focus on three uh, key areas. That's A, the strategic level and the operational level second. Also, we could call it the military level and then the industrial layer, the procurement perspective. And I think these are the three key areas you need to look at. Uh, when you talk about that. And taking up the strategic level, let's take the term strategy. I am convinced that in the German um, political system, policy making system, we have an uh, inherent strategy making deficit. We call a lot of things strategy, but um, from my perspective, it's not really a strategy because strategy means prioritizing some things and deprioritizing other things. It means deciding what you're gonna do, but it also means deciding what you're not gonna do. In Germany, we always like to do everything or nothing. Uh, we're kind of in between. Strategy needs goals, um, and they need to be specific and, and quantifiable. Um, if you look into our strategy documents, often you won't see anti anything quantifiable. Um, we call those goals smart. They need to be uh, specific, measurable, achievable, um, relevant, time-bound. That's, that's the methodology approach to that. And I understand that sometimes um, being vague is, is uh, from a political view, uh, can be an advantage. But uh, from the policy making view, I would not, uh, I would not, um, I would not go down that road. Um, too often, also strategies in Germany are just a collection of initiatives. You can look at our digital strategy, for example, at the moment. It's just a collection. I'm sorry, but that's not a strategy. So I think when we talk about the strategic level in, in defense policy making and excitement and where we need to go, we need to, we need to talk about that change we need uh, to, m to get engaged in real strategy making. And um, we also need with that strategy making organizational structure change and also the, the change of the procedures of the process organization. Mm -hmm. And that also leads to one of the, the really ground zero discussions, the there are good reasons for it, but uh, the forced division in Germany between internal and external security, which is, after all, in that whole um, how we perceive defense policy in the future is, is a, big, um, a big stone in the way. Coming to the operational level, the military perspective, the government has vowed to make the Bundeswehr um, one, one, if not the most powerful army in, in Europe, and we have not seen that change yet. However, of course, that change is not uh, is not is not going to be there so fast. Um, with the last Minister of Defense um, Lambrecht, um, who didn't succeed in many ways, now with the new Defense Minister, um, I uh, hear a lot of good things on the communication level. Um, it it sounds like we're going into the right direction. Of course, uh, he's in office for a couple of days, and uh, we need to see um, if he can deliver and the government can deliver. But if we look at the armed forces. Um, we see that they are under a lot of stress. There, is, there are new tasks, new assignments uh, since the Madrid uh, summit, for example, enhanced vigilant activities in uh, the brigade uh, forward command element in Lithuania, Slovakia, <coughs> more air policing. This year starting, we are now doing uh, NATO VJTF lead again. Um, so more assignments, more tasks, 
but the resources have more or less stayed the same. And um, politics needs to follow up with that. And uh, we are also training Ukrainian brigade equivalent elements. So there is a lot of thing li things on the plate for the uh, for the Bundeswehr and more to come. The NATO new force model, for example, in the future will uh, will require more commitment from the Bundeswehr in terms of readiness and more deployable troops. One mechanized division that's like 16,000 uh, uh, additional soldiers and, and airplanes and navy vessels. So there's a lot more to come, and politics needs to to um, to counter um, all the the shortcomings that the Bundeswehr still has. The two main areas are basically personnel. Um, we have a future overhead count of 203,000 soldiers, but we're somewhere hovering around 183, 184,000 right now. And uh, um, when I still work for the for the in-house consulting of the German Ministry of Defense, one of my last projects was actually the the HR strategy. And I can tell you, it's 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 hard. It's it, you it's you can say just 20,000 people, but um, you need to close that gap. And also then on the technical uh, side, you have the readiness issue, um, how, to, how to tackle that. And then, of course, back to the organization part. Uh, I am convinced that the, how the Ministry of Defense, for example, is organized is not fit for, for future anymore. We, we got rid of something called the, the planning staff that was there until um, uh, 2011. And now it is organized like a typical ministry, but that is not fit for the, for the purpose and also the Bundeswehr probably needs some adjustments. And then we move on to the industrial layer. And I think this is really where a lot of the discussion is. The famous 100 billion um, um, special budget. Um, you have to see that this is just enough to fulfill our capability requirements that we set ourselves in 2018. So what we, what we can do with that is almost, fu almost fulfilling that because now inflation is kicking in. We're probably down to 80, 85 thousand billion, uh, um, um, and that is just not enough. And um, if you take the voices from politics, the Armed Forces Commissioner Eva Hügel, um, actually from the Social Democratic Party, so from the Chancellor's party, said perhaps we need 300 billion. Um, the Army Chief said it's not enough. The National Armament Director Admiral Stavitsky said it's not enough. So we need to, to do more. Um, we just briefly touched upon the, the issue ammunition is not in the budget. So we can go into details what's, what's wrong with that. We already touched upon the 2%. <coughs> um, defense budget in this year, 2023, is actually going down uh, compared to last year. 300 million. It's not, it's not a lot, but it's going down. If we take in the special budget, we're probably able to, to balance it over two years. Then we will get over the 2%. But after that, after the special budget is gone, um, then we have to actually increase our defense budget uh, the regular way. So um, we also expect that the NATO target for the 2% will probably be raised in Vilnius this summer. So what are we going to do with that? And at the same time, Germany has really neglected its arms industry. Um, over years, the production capacity went down. Um, it's really hard for some of the arms uh, corporations to get uh, capital at the market. So there are new ESG requirements which makes it really hard to get capital at the, at the financial markets. Um, and there need to be incentives and insurances um, um, that the government will, will uh, co cooperate. It's kind of moving from an unwanted stepchild relationship that's the past, and we need to get it in more into a national security interest relationship, national security asset. And that also requires, of course, more European cooperation. Mm. And if you sum this all up, and I will stop here, I mean, if you, if you take this over, over the, the div different dimensions, strategic level, operational, and industrial level, it just means that we need more capacity, um, capacity in strategy making. We mm -hmm. need to, as I uh, elaborated, we need to do more strategy making the right way, and uh, we need more capabilities to assess, um, to decide, but also to act. Sounds very easy, of course it's not. Um, and yeah, happy to discuss further. Yeah, thank you, Benny. Uh, first of all, thank you for your um, well, thought-provoking uh, uh, ideas uh, when it comes to the two percent and how much uh, Germany is spending. Uh, well, I, I'm not advocate of Germany, but I have to say and I appreciate also <laughs> what Germany has has done also here in the Baltic states, right? You mentioned, and this is rightly so, uh, highly appreciated uh, also from the Latvia's perspective, is that Germany is the framework nation of the Lithuanian battalion that will be uh, transformed into brigade, right? Uh, Germany is participating <coughs> in Baltic <coughs> air policing. Germany is 
part uh, has been part of uh, military exercises and also investing in in our military industry so germany has has been active but taking into account that germany is kind of a superpower the, the perception of at least from the baltic perspective is that germany has to play a leading leading role you were mentioning about the strategies uh has Mm, Russia's aggression, and particularly its anti-force of the February, changed also the perception of political elite and as well as society when it comes to the how to deal with the Putin. I mean, you know, this discussion before the uh, b before the b before the conflict or before the Russia entered into Ukraine and before the large-scale conventional war uh, on 14th of February, Scholz was in in Moscow speaking with. Um, with with Putin, that was perceived from the Baltic perspective as a show of weakness. Uh, some someone would argue that it's a show of strength that we can speak and we have to say something. Uh, how this has changed? I mean, how the perception, uh, how to deal with the Putin's Russia or Russia's Putin, yeah. uh, has changed? I mean, it's a great question because I think the answer is probably in that sense Germany is not united. Uh, just coming from Berlin, where. A couple of days ago, we saw a big demonstration, also although they said it was bigger than in, in the end it was. A um, uh, politician from, from the left uh, um, party and uh, a former activist, femi feminist activist, they both came together and did a peace <coughs> demonstration. I would say it was more like a Russian propaganda talking points demonstration. Um, and and kind of catches a, a sentiment that you find in some parts of, of the of the society. So has, has the German society changed on the whole? No. I think the majority, yes. Um, especially when you look at the political leads, you can always ask the question, did they see it coming? Hmm. Um, I think if you are deep down in the defense uh, uh, policy area and uh, or you deal with, with um, military things, perhaps you overestimate how, um, how clear it was um, if you're not dealing with that on a daily basis. Um, but I think what we can see and what is quite tremendous is that we're getting rid of the idea, the German idea, changing through trade. And that uh, is, is one of the fundamental ideas that um, um, was the, the idea of many German governments um, um, of all colors, um, that we can change Rus Russia by just keeping them closed, trading, um, that Germany has kind of the secret key to mm. that. I think... I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, uh, this has changed, and I think this this is probably the biggest change. And also in in in, in civil society, when I when I talk to to peers, especially from the Green Party, for example, discussion here has changed a lot, mm. um, especially when it comes to defense policy and the stance of defense. When uh, prominent politicians of the of the Green, Anton Hofweiter, are talking about tanks in a way I would have never believed that. Uh, um, because the Green Party, especially those uh, people from the Green Party, come from a more, um, yeah, not pacifist, but more um, uh, peace politics oriented uh, 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 corner of the room and are not the, the classic foreign policy hawks. Mm. Uh, so I would say there is a lot of change, but uh, you, I think you cannot say that the German, German society has changed on a whole because there's still layers um, that are, are working on it. Yeah, um, exactly, and there are a lot of polls showing that there is reluctance from the German society as well to provide more and more military uh, aid when it comes to the uh, Ukraine. Um, just one reminder, uh, you see in your slides and those who are um, joining us uh, online, there is a Slido a QR code that you can use for the uh, questions and I will receive uh, them, them in my smartphone and I will ask for the panelists. But Coming back to you, Hart, before I open the Q&A for the in-person attendees. Uh, someone argues that uh, there is a kind of a Scholzenism in, in uh, German uh, policy, meaning that this is all of Scholz's uh, personal policy uh, when it comes to the Russia itself, when it comes to the Putin trying to find, as uh, previously noted, win-win uh, situation, uh, excluding any kind of zero-sum game. Uh, whether it's all of Scholz himself, uh, how or uh, put it in different words, is the political elite uh, homogeneous? I mean, is there unity and solidarity when it comes to the how to deal with the Germany, uh, how to deal with the, with the Russia? 
Yes, uh, I think this is a, 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 a really a, a time change that we, our eye, eyes are now more open on on the reality reality in in Russia as it was before, and uh, um, um, uh, 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 change through trade might be not a wrong concept, but you need a plan B that works instead that it does not work. And uh, uh, I would like to say, in case that we would be more strength. Uh, more strong uh, uh, in the Western world, and more maybe more more um, uh, robust um, on uh, 2014 when when Russia attacks uh, Ukraine by uh, occupying the Crimea and uh, 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 occupying parts of Eastern Ukraine. Uh, maybe we never came to came to that point where we are now. I raised my hand because uh, I want. To, to add something on the uh, um, uh, remarks of Benedict and also of you, Martins, on strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have a lack of strategy in Germany, but the reason for that is not that we would not be able to define strategies uh, from the intellectual point of view. And every, every idea is already thought in Germany, but the risks or the, the reason why we don't have uh, written strategies on several important points or written strategies but without content is that everybody knows about the result of the strategies and don't want to follow the results and therefore they are reluctant to make strategies. I give you an example. Yeah, We have no in the energy security strategy in Europe because everybody knew about that in case that we define such an energy security independence strategy for European energy, the result would have been clearly not to take so much gas from Russia. And especially Germany, especially the social democratic camp and the, so and the German government didn't want to reduce gas from Russia and therefore they didn't want to have a strategy on energy security because they know the outcome. And this is always uh, the discussion. We have not a lack in, in intellectual competence to define strategies. We have, a, so to say, more a risk or more, more uh, um, a reluctant uh, uh, behavior of politicians that they expect results of strategies they don't want to follow and therefore they um, don't want to have those strategies. And this is where we are in Germany now. And this shows... Uh, that our intellectual society and political society is not uh, close behind. I think there's a huge number of people, even in politics, that hopes that once a day, when um, the Ukraine crisis is solved in one or the other way, we might come back to more relaxed relations to Russia. I can tell you from my point of view, even if Mother Teresa might become president of Russia, Germany should never take as much gas from Russia as we did uh, um, um, uh, up to February last year. And um, uh, uh, therefore, we don't have consensus in Germany about uh, what, what might be the long-lasting results of that confrontation we have now. Uh, a significant number of people expect that uh, this is only a thunderstorm, and after that thunderstorm, uh, there is nuclear air uh, for dialogue and, and uh, maybe um, uh, trade and, and uh, the change through trade and, and other things that it was as it was before or we expected uh, or hoped that it was before. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is also, I think, one of the main differences between the German and Baltic perspective uh, as we perceive uh, uh, Russia. I mean, uh, from our perspective, it's even after the Vladimir Putin, Putinism will not disappear. I mean, uh, whether it's, well, we don't know wh who would be the next one, uh, but definitely the ideology, ideology and um, uh, norms and values uh, that are present right now in, the, in, the, in Russia will be, will be there. Uh, so this will be the challenge. It is a long-term challenge from our perspective. Uh, with this, I'm opening, uh, opening the floor uh, for also in-person attendees. So uh, raise your hand. Introduce yourself. A oh, oh, lot of questions. Okay, let's start with uh, Adis and then and Irina. And uh, yeah, yeah, you have a microphone. Uh, it is coming. I used to be a politician, but I'm retired now. <laughs> uh, two questions. 
actually both to you, but especially to uh, Mr. Hart. Isn't the security strategy to be ready in a week or two? You're working on it in the Bundestag. We know. We're expecting it. And you're saying, no, no. <laughs> you have to wait longer than a week or two weeks or what, three weeks. So what's happening? Where is it now? And the other thing is, yes, maybe under Lambrecht, you could say, mention all these uh, shortcomings. But th there was an article today in Politico Europe also outlining the shortcomings. It's not a Zeitin Wende, it's a Zeitin Sham. <laughs> it's not really happening. <laughs> Imagine, Politico Europe. But uh, I think it's changed with Pistorius. Please back me up. Because Lambrecht, yes, but Pistorius, you mentioned it. Uh, oh, your name was Meng, yes, Mr. Meng. Uh, that uh, under Pistorius, at least, communication is different. But I feel that there is more, because I read German and I follow very closely what's happening in Germany. There's even going to be a major maneuver, war game, in Poland with American and Polish troops and German troops. Now, that's a big step forward. If I may, maybe on, on this occasion, uh, the first question for you, Mr. Hart, and then the second one for you, Menem. Yeah. I try to give a short answer. I'm not um, a member of the government coalition, but I have learned that uh, the process uh, of uh, national strategy, uh, security strategy, uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, now postponed up to April. We expected that the coalition decided in uh, the coalition treaty they wrote Within a year, the year is uh, already over a long time, yeah. uh, we expected to have it uh, on the Munich Security Conference. It was not. Uh, we expected to have it this week. This week there will be the presentation of the um, feminine foreign policy um, uh, strategy of the government, of the foreign um, office. And I expect to have the national security strategy in April. And maybe the answers will not be as sufficient as you, especially in the Baltics or other NATO partners, expect. But this is um, only uh, looking into a class, class bowl. Um, I'm, I'm not sure and I will not um, criticize the strategy that is not yet on the table. Thank you. Yeah, with regard to Pistorius, of course you're right. He has all the, all the things on the table to succeed, obviously. Um, but only time will tell. I'm, uh, I mean, now what we it's only on the communicational level because, and he's actually making a great job. I, uh, yes, I'm, I'll totally give him that. And also, um, and I think that's the fundamental difference to his uh, predecessor. He also does not come from the security and defense field, but he seems to at least listen to the right advisors or he's actually up to speed quite fast, which is a good sign. And I, I hope that this will, this will be a, a, good, uh, a good thing for, for German security and defense policy in the future. But, and I think that's also where the link is probably to the national security strategy. Uh, from what I know, there is some sort of disconnect between the foreign office and, uh, and the chancellery. And perhaps we'll also see, um, I mean, Pistorius being a minister of defense, he's also dependent on what's happening in the chancellery. So what can happen to the NSS can also happen to anything that's coming out of the Ministry of Defense. So we will see how that uh, plays out. Um, the whole national security strategy uh, thing is not, a, is not a good PR stunt. I mean, it should have been ready by the Munich Security Conference last week. Uh, it wasn't. Um, everyone knows about it. Uh, the, the dispute is quite open. So um, from a strategic communications pr pr uh, perspective, this is, this is really not, not, the best, not the best operation. And in terms of you, you talked about that maneuver. Yes, that is important, and it's great that we're doing that. But in the end, it's simply not enough because um, German defense policy needs more than just, and I, I don't want to undervalue uh, a, a maneuver like that. I, I know that the signaling, but it, it needs structural change, structural change in, in, in many areas. And in it, it shouldn't just be uh, more of the same, but with more money. And also, as we just heard, the more money is very limited. So I'm, I'm waiting for more. Great. Irina, please. Irina Kuznetsova, a civic activist. Uh, I have a question uh, to Benedict. Uh, this is two questions. And the first, you've uh, mentioned a lot and quite many times uh, that we are, we are not doing enough uh, in terms of um, defense spending. And then I have a question. So who is dragging the feet? I mean, the government, a specific political group or a political party, or maybe the chancellor himself closely watching the public opinion. And who should really take an action in this regard? And the second about 
war fatigue. Should we really be afraid about war fatigue spreading uh, among German population in the foreseeable future? Okay, let's take another one. Uh, Imans, please. Hi, uh, Iman Sliagis, former Minister of Defence and former Ambassador, um, and now a researcher at the Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, thanks very much for your presentations. Uh, one comment uh, and then a couple of questions. The comment is I was quite shocked to read uh, recently that uh, Germany, in benefiting from the peace dividend, has reduced the number of battle tanks post-1991 uh, from 5,000 in, in the 1990s to uh, 320 today. So that was my comment. I mean, you have touched on uh, the need to build up the Bundeswehr and, and obviously that's uh, an issue. Uh, leading on to that, uh, relations with Russia. Um, I get the sense that uh, Russia tends to manipulate uh, relations with Germany by always referring to and making Germany feel guilty for for its role in the Second World War. Do you see uh, politicians and society sort of moving away from that guilt aspect and uh, uh, you know, being able to take on, uh, because I think that's linked into the leadership role of Germany in some ways, it seems to be hindering it. Is there any movement away from this sort of constant uh, feeling of guilt for the Second World War? And then the second question, uh, in trying to understand Germany, and uh, what's happening within Europe. Uh, how has the reaction to Zeitenwender been in, uh, with uh, your most important partner in the European Union, that's France? You know, can you give us some sort of sense of how things are moving in, in the very important motor, in inverted commas, relations uh, of Germany and France? Thank you. Okay, maybe you start, and then, then Mr. Hart. Okay. Comes in. So. Um, I'll start with you, the, the who's writing the strategies. Of course, I mean, that's, that's, that's um, the government's job. The, the process, how it works in G the German ministerial bureaucracy is very much relying on branches. So we have every ministry has a director generals. The work, the main work is done by the branches. You can, you can call this like a deficit by structure. Um, so uh, they are doing the main work. And then, of course, this is uh, the, the structure. Strategy can be can be uh, prepared bottom up, but it needs to be executed bottom down. And often that is then where the problem is because there's different political um, ideas and disputes out there. Um, war fatigue, yes. I mean, I think there is the possibility that some, some parts of, of the society actually get something like war fatigue. My answer to that would be that we sh need to start doing more strat strategic uh, communication measures. So perhaps let's talk about um, training Ukrainian soldiers. What does that mean? And uh, do media campaigns, for example, I, it's always nice to talk about something you call the unswipable content. So nothing you can just swipe away on your phone. How about some billboards or something, a positive campaign about what this contribution means for, for not only the security in, in, in Ukraine, but also the security in Europe on a, on a broader level. Um, Moving on the the battle tanks, yes, um, I mean of course, going from two thousands or thousands of battle tanks to and and, and reducing them, there was it, it, you, you can argue for that. However, I mean, so I remember when I joined the armed forces, and there's others here who can probably like have a, have a better view on that. Uh, everything we did and trained for was international crisis management. So, uh, out of area operations, uh, very light forces. Um, the classical uh, combined warfare with tanks was not uh, uh, was not uh, the main emphasis, um, and I'm an, an army of army reserve officer, so um, th yeah, that that's how it was. So um, um, we're changing that since 2014, slowly, steadily. It's changing now, and I have the feeling since, uh, especially since t February 24th uh, last year, a lot has changed, and actually that's also where. I I, I want to say um, that's actually a, a, a great thing that our armed forces are doing. They're doing that on their own, how they're training their own soldiers, how they're um, actually talking about war again, that what you need to, 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 to have to, to sustain uh, such, a, uh, such a situation um, that you're um, talking about victory in, in, in a conflict. So the narrative is really changing there and um, I, I see that as a positive thing for the armed forces. The guilt aspect. I wouldn't call it guilt, it's more responsibility, um, is that 
I know that yes, the Russian narrative sometimes plays with that, um, but I think you can turn it around and exactly make a case why Germany should be engaged uh, for uh, Ukraine, for the security in Europe, out of that historical responsibility to not make uh, uh, mistakes of the past again and, and play a leading role um, for, for a free uh, uh, and united Europe. And therefore, when you turn it around, and I would like to call it a more um, responsibility, and less guilt, and then also the whole narrative makes more sense uh, to me. And uh, France, yeah, I mean, France, it's, it's like sometimes it's, I mean, the relationship is, is, is when it comes to defense policy, interesting sometimes. And now, um, <laughs> with the, and this was without a, uh, <laughs> without saying it's positive or negative, but now with NATO being back at the forefront um, of, um, of defense policy and underlining that role, the ideas that we had in 20 IT, uh, 2018 about strategic autonomy, I think this discussion is now changing. I know that some people in Paris uh, uh, don't like the way th that this is going and also German initiatives that are now coming. Uh, let's talk about the European Sky Shield initiative, an initiative about air defense. Um, there was a comment uh, at the Munich Security Conference from the French side uh, saying actually we should talk about air defense. Uh, the French approach to f air defense, I understood that as a little answer to that, uh, to that um, initiative. So I think there, there, are, there are discussions to, to that we need to have um, between allies. Um, um, I would, and I'm not a French uh, defense foreign policy expert, but I, I would like to understand more what actually the, the February 24th uh, did right, to right. policy discussions in France. Actually, that's something I can't talk about, um, but that would interest me uh, uh, tremendously. Good point. Uh, uh, Imans mentioned uh, uh, partner. I would, I would disagree with this slightly. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Hart, uh, please, uh, anything uh, from your side on guilt, France, or uh, war fatigue? Yeah, I would, would, would start with France. Um, when we were in Paris, a delegation of the Deutsche Bundestag to celebrate the 60th uh, anniversary of the LEC Treaty, the Friendship Treaty between Germany and France, uh, there were the two speeches of uh, President Macron and Chancellor Scholz. And President Macron mentioned uh, on to the address of Olaf Scholz, I, I, this was my impression, we will not, we will not only be judged for that what we are doing mm -hmm. we will also be judged for that what we are not doing and uh, having in mind that normally the german government never criticized french government in public and uh, vice versa it was a clear message to olaf scholz to do more um, for the common uh, security issues from my my point of view and uh, uh, maybe it was especially also um, uh, the French position on uh, uh, German tanks for Ukraine. Uh, the second point concerning um, the, uh, so to say, the, the, the uh, Russian complex, maybe uh, Germans should have, uh, the, the German uh, Russian history is uh, um, uh, very uh, long and, and uh, experienced. Um, and, and I think there is a common consensus that uh, conflict with Russia cannot be um, uh, 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 solved militarily. I think this is a, also a consensus in Germany that we should avoid any direct military confrontation with Russia. But having in mind that it was not Europe or Ukraine or Germany that started the war against Ukraine, but Russia, um, it's a wrong uh, decision uh, that some people take in Germany to say um, if there's a military confrontation, we should uh, not react uh, militarily, but uh, diplomatic-wise. And this was uh, the mind and mood on the street in Berlin from those 13,000 protesters. I think they are not a majority. I would like to say in Germany, maybe two thirds are in favor of more support for Ukraine. One third are in favor of... Uh, um, um, uh, not sponsoring the war, but uh, going a diplomatic way, however it should uh, be. But looking to the people that had been on the street um, um, on, on uh, last, uh, uh, was it Saturday? I think it was Saturday, last Saturday here in Berlin. My wife was here and she told me about that probably most of the protesters were 
uh, coming out of the old um, socialistic elite of the GDR, uh, those people that were educated in the Soviet Union, and for them, uh, uh, Soviet Union was, so to say, the role model for the, the best and biggest uh, um, ever. And it's a miracle that those who were in favor of the socialistic, communistic leadership of the Soviet Union are now in favor of this kleptocratic, uh, um, uh, highly corrupt uh, uh, Russian president who changed uh, uh, Russia from a, um, a socialistic or social welfare state into a, um, a, a, a pure um, capitalism um, state. Uh, but they are in favor of Russia, and they will never give that up. And uh, also on the right side, um, uh, demonstrators are on the side of those old communists that are appreciating um, the, the fascistic behavior of, of Putin, which is uh, in some ways uh, similar to that what we saw in the last century from fascists. Therefore, um, uh, uh, there is a, a huge question behind the homogeneity of those who are against more engagement in, in Ukraine and against uh, 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 showing a strong uh, 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 answer to that what Russia does. And, and therefore, um, uh, not only the uh, non-support Ukraine camp is uh, 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 not, not only the supporters of Ukraine are not homogeneous, but also the non-supporters of Ukraine and of that politics now are not, not homogeneous. And uh, the lines are going directly uh, through political camps um, in, in Germany. Um, and, and last point I would like to mention, uh, looking to the equipment of the Bundeswehr, we should not, uh, 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 not, not uh, miss to, to have in mind that uh, under uh, Ursula von der Leyen and under Gret Kram Karrenbau, the defense budget in Germany was increased from 33 billion euros up to 55 billion euros. Uh, this was a significant increase, uh, two double-digit increase year by year. It was not enough, but by the way, the number of tanks in the German Bundeswehr was increased by um, uh, from from 20, uh, 250 up to 320 now, which is. Uh, not not enough, but uh, significant more than it was before. We were we were weaker, um, uh, much weaker in the Bundeswehr uh, some years ago as we are now. And unfortunately, I have sometimes the feeling that also the German government, who don't want to step in with more engagement in some fields, maybe in uh, in the Baltics or um, uh, in in Mali, to give an example. Um, uh, 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 or to, to support um, um, Ukraine stronger, they sometimes use that also as a potential, as an um, um, Ausrede, an exclusion for not doing more because they, they, the Bundeswehr is so weak. Um, uh, I think some people in the government camp have no problem uh, with the reason that the Bundeswehr is uh, too weak because they have an argument uh, uh, towards others uh, not to do more. I think the truth maybe is in between. Thank you. Uh, um, let's take a last round of, uh, of questions too here, please. Hello, um, Eric McPherson from the Embassy of Spain, though I'm representing more myself than the institution here. Um, the big question I sort of have is about the feasibility of all the measures I've been hearing about here. Um, I've, I'm especially interested um, about this um, aspect that uh, Martins has mentioned, this policy versus mentality, a mentality change. Uh, but I do kind of have the impression that mentality is usually a result of the self of self perception. And with the certain, uh, with the new data we have from the German Statistical Office that indicates that the last um, three months of 2022, the, the German economy shrank by uh, 0.4 percent, and it, with this fear of recession or of an economic crisis, how feasible is it to um, to think that certain policies are going to be able to be conducted? In the sense also that, because of public opinion as well, um, whether we like or not what, Mer what uh, the policies uh, towards Russia that, Ma that Angela Merkel did, which I personally do not like, um, it is true, however, that because she stayed for 15 years in power, this whole idea of foreign policy as a state policy uh, was kind of well uh, grounded. 
However, there is this certain lingering idea that Olaf Scholz is not going to, to really be able to like have a second term and he's only going to last four years. So this idea of how could maybe these um, certain policies be linked to the political figure of Olaf Scholz and how risky is it if Olaf Scholz's figure is in danger of disappearing in the, in the uh, further two, three years to come. Uh, how can that affect everything? Okay, thank you. And here, please, gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Hamid Lajaradi. Uh, I appreciate your uh, comments, especially addressing all the critical issues that uh, we're all faced with. Uh, I read uh, Chancellor Schultz's uh, speech on uh, Financial Times. I was very happy to hear what he had to say. But uh, all the things that I want to ask you are, have already, the issues have been raised, but I want to raise them in a maybe different manner. Germany has been known uh, since the last 70 years as a great export machine. Given the productivity of the German uh, labor, uh, given the cheap energy from Russia, given the uh, cheap euro, and finally, underspending in the defense area. In that context, the tanks were mentioned as how they have drastically been reduced, but the last time I looked at, I understand of the six submarines that the German uh, Navy has, none of them are operational. In their Air Force, I understand only 10% of them are, are operational. So uh, it's, it's, it's a fundamental uh, issue systematic issue. Uh, question, question please. Yes. Uh, the question will come. Uh, We're a bit running out of the time. <laughs> Fair enough. The question comes down to, are these changes that Schultz talked about, are they sustainable uh, in the long run? Is this just a putting your feet into the water, or are the Germans going to dive in wholeheartedly according to uh, what Chancellor Schultz wrote in his speech, which was reprinted in the Financial Times. Finally, about the Russian lobby. Now, that has been raised. My history professor said there's a love-hate relation between the Germans and the Russians. Uh, is this going to go away, or is this going to be a long-term process where once the Ukraine war is over, it will raise its head again. Those are the issues I'd like you to give specific answers to. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for both of you. And I would like to add my, my, my question, the last one. Um, you know, there are now a lot of conferences when uh, representatives from the Baltic states are, uh, are participating and starting their introductory remarks. We told you so. Uh, we told you so and we were right, right? Um, and it comes also for the selling our interests and ideas uh, also to the Germany. Uh, help us, uh, gentlemen, how to sell our ideas to, to the Germany, uh, how to ensure that our interests are heard very well in, in, in Bundestag or uh, in other corridors of the German foreign and security policy. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Hart, please, maybe we can start with you, Mr. Hart. I try to give a, 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 a quick answer. Uh, first, uh, having dialogue between uh, uh, the uh, civil society and governments in Baltic states and Germany is uh, of huge importance. And on the Munich Security Conference, I had a meeting with, with Foreign Minister Landsbergis from Lithuania, with uh, Pre President Kalas from Estonia. Uh, we, we listen carefully. We as Christian Democrats listen, listen carefully. And I, I'm sure that also my colleagues from the Greens, the Liberals and the Social Democrats uh, do so. Um, second, concerning Bundeswehr. I think one of the biggest problems we have in Bundeswehr is the procurement process. The uh, process how Bundeswehr decides which material should be bought and who should build it and and and. And I think this is one of the biggest tasks of Pistorius, uh, the new uh, defense minister. I trust in him and, and I also see a, 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 a huge change for the Bundeswehr with this defense minister, to be frank. He's not from a party, but uh, he is totally different to that what uh, 
uh, Madam Lambrecht uh, 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 delivered to us. And uh, I think to, 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 um, uh, to modify and maybe to, to revolution the, uh, the procurement process of the Bundeswehr is one of the biggest tasks we have. Um, and by the way, just to mention, uh, the situation was never in the Bundeswehr that none of the six submarines were able to go. This is uh, always, uh, nobody knows what about our submarines because it's a secret and should be a secret. To be frank, if you have six submarines, uh, you um, have those six to have two uh, in uh, operation uh, uh, permanently because uh, the other uh, from out of three, one is uh, maybe under um, uh, modernization or uh, in the shipyard for renovation. Uh, the second is used for training of uh, the crew up to the highest level. And the third is um, in action. And if you have six submarines, you um, plan to have two in, 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 in the in, in, in the, uh, concrete 100% uh, uh, capability uh, with 100% capabilities in service, and this is too less. We order new submarines for the Deutsche Bundeswehr, um, but it is not as uh, some people argued that there was no submarine in Germany uh, bay underway or only 10% of um, aircraft. We have a huge um, lack in spare parts because uh, spare parts are very expensive, and the package um, um, of, 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 of spare parts for, for uh, medical, uh, uh, military equipment uh, is sometimes up to 70% of the uh, total price of that um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, military system. And due to financial reasons and due to the peace that was outbroken in Europe in the 90s and uh, beginning of the 21st century, um, a lot of people say we can order spare parts if we need them. We have not to hold them on stock because otherwise we have to throw it away. And this was also a big mistake. And this was the reason why sometimes repairment in German Bundeswehr takes longer than uh, under normal circumstances. This is a second field where the new defense minister has to do hard work. Thank you. Mr. Thank you very much. Con concluding remarks for you. Mary. Yeah. Um... So, with respect to the, the 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 budget, and yes, you can always only spend budget once. So, uh, this morning, I think when I was driving to the airport, I, I listened to to an interview that the, the Minister of Labor, uh, Labor, uh, Hubertus Heil, was asked about the the uh, Bundeswehr budget. And of course, this, these are the two main budgets in the, in the German uh, um, household that are competing. I, I would don't like that term, but uh, in the end, you can see it that way. And uh, you can only spend money once. And uh, that's why you need to make a good case. And the, the problem with defense policy is if everything you do works out, you buy those tanks and you will never use them. And try selling that to the population really hard. Um, I, haven't, I have a, don't have a recipe for that, but I think th it comes down to that question to find a narrative uh, doing that. Defense is, is successful if you... Yeah, if you don't have to use it or uh, you successfully defend yourself, but this is of course really hard, especially now. Everyone is experienced. You go home, you get your new gas bill. Um, it's really hard. And then if you work in that field, it's it's hard. I can explain to myself why this makes sense, but um, it's yeah, it is really hard uh, to, to to tell that to someone in Berlin on the street, and they're probably fighting for their existence. Yes, I don't have a I don't have a um, a patent recipe for that. Um, with the 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 readiness discussion, that is a this is a favorite German media debate about readiness, and we every once in a while we have an article about our planes not flying, submarines not 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 a thing. <coughs> readiness in military terms is really difficult. How the readiness levels are are calculated, and um, I just because um, an airplane is not operational in that sense doesn't mean it's like in parts on the on the ground. So you have to. It, it it always sounds very devastating when you read it in the media, and I would like uh, to see some more d differentiation when when talking about that topic because it is actually very very difficult. And also, and uh, Jürgen had uh, perfectly explained it. Um, there's always some someone in 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 maintenance. Uh, I I think I've never never seen that all American aircraft carriers are out at sea. It doesn't work like that. Uh, same is uh, on a much s smaller scale in the German army. It's 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 a lot of uh, technical stuff after all. And um, yeah, Jung had also mentioned the, the the thing logistics and 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 
also ammunition. If I can put out put up a, a wish list for for the military, I would like the debate to be more about logistics, spare parts, and ammunition. Also, when we talk about Ukraine and assistance to Ukraine, everyone always in Germany loves talking about tanks this, tanks that. I don't think it makes sense on that level. You need to, because it's combined arms warfare, you need to see it as a whole. It's a system, it's not a tank that will bring the change. It's, it's, the, whole, it's the whole operational, the maneuver warfare that brings change. But what is decisive is ammunition. We've seen weeks in the summer where the Russians and the Ukrainians they shot between 60 and 80,000 artillery grenades per week. Um, that's a lot. S the German, and it's a very big company, a German company, Rheinmetall, is able to manufacture 80,000 artillery grenades per year. Um, and that's, that's, that's the level we're talking about. We're, we're talking about we're shooting uh, uh, um, very simple ammunition, World War I style, but we're not able with a production capacity to, to reproduce it. And I think the discussion should be more about that and less about Leopard 1, Leopard 2. And um, about the how can we uh, bring the Baltic narrative uh, to, to Germany. Uh, um, I think um, Germany has been at, at the forefront of, of, of defense during the Cold War, and Germany benefited a lot during that time from, from its allies because uh, it got all the backing and all the military forces stationed there. And I think the key, perhaps not the, the only key, but it could be uh, worthwhile to try setting up a narrative um, that now this, this, this line has shifted. It has shifted to the east. You can talk about, is it Ukraine? It's also the Baltics. Um, that doesn't mean we're not, uh, uh, the threat perception perhaps in Germany has changed, but we need to talk about that. And that also means that back then when we received help and support and, and, and defense support uh, from our allies, that now it's up to us to, to give that support um, to, to our allies in the Baltics, um, but also um, to, um, to our uh, partners and friends in, mm. in, in Ukraine. And um, that mu must not be the, the only way to approach it, that, but that would my be my, my go. Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you gentlemen, for this so provoking discussion. And I think that frank and open discussion has always been a strength of the transatlantic community, right? And this was one of the examples, uh, trying to understand what is Germany about. And rightly so, I, I was thinking about that uh, while you were speaking that well, this is also our opportunity while the Germany is transforming, bringing closer uh, the mindset, the perception of Germany to, to the Baltic states and sell our narrative to the, to the Germany. And hopefully uh, in cooperation with you, in cooperation with, uh, with Konrad Stiftung and other stakeholders here in, in Baltic states and Germany, we will do that. So once again, thank you. Thank you for participating and please join me uh, for a round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Yeah, and please, snacks and coffee over there. <laughs>